George Carlin once said that you can laugh at everything, implying that nothing is safe or sacred from humor or art. The subject of today's episode has taken that to heart and has gone beyond what most people would deem as normal or even acceptable in many cases. As we all know though, normal is nothing you'd want to aspire to, particularly in the world of art. His portrayal of women as well as his sexually rampant self-portraiture led to waves of feminist critics. It had some validity, he would later admit. My work is full of anger towards women. I was sent to Catholic school with scary nuns and I was rejected by girls at high school. I sort of got it out of my system, but anger is normal between the sexes. Okay, it can go to the top and men can harm women, but if anyone says they are not angry, I don't believe it, especially while your libido is still going. Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, cartoonists, and weirdness. I'm your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and on this episode, we explore the forming years of Robert Crumb. People have to classify and categorize everything. It makes life look so much simpler. Life is much too complex and vague to draw lines and put everything securely under certain headings." End quote. Robert Crumb's father, Charles Crumb Sr., was born in Albert Lee, Minnesota and was raised on a farm as one of 14 children. Later in life, he would meet and marry Beatrice Hall of Milford, Delaware. Robert's mother, according to Robert himself, came from an unstable urban lower middle working class family who shifted up and down the East Coast. Now, the Crumbs' first child, Carol, was born circa 1940-41. Charles Jr., who would be the main driver in Robert's ambition to become a cartoonist, followed in 1942. Then came Robert, born on August 30th, 1943 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was then followed by younger brother Maxon in 1945, and finally the family was rounded off with the baby sister, Sandra, in 1956. The kids were marine brats on account of their father's profession. Consequently, the family moved frequently. By the time Robert was 15 years old, the family had lived in both Philadelphia and Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, as well as Minnesota, Iowa, California, and Delaware, Delaware appearing to have had the most lasting and direct effect on the brothers. Now, the Crom brothers were regularly beat up in school. Robert particularly remembers getting beat up by a girl when he was in the third grade. She broke his glasses, which led to him rushing home, in tears. His father, an atheist, ironically sent all his kids to Catholic school. To him, the discipline of the Catholic school was far superior to that of the general school system. Because of this, the Crum children were practically raised religious. Now, the idea of upholding these Catholic values was most likely the reason the parents never divorced, despite the years of turbulence in their marriage. Now, his father was a typical 50s male in a bland suit with the stereotypical views that reflected the times. Later, many figures similar to his father would show up in Robert's underground comics. Now, according to Robert, his brother Charles was obsessed with comics. He didn't like playing with toys or playing with other children. All he cared about was reading and drawing comics. Robert, on the other hand, had other interests within the spectrum of drawing. He liked drawing realistic scenes, buildings, cars, etc. Charles, however, wasn't interested in any of that. Thus, as a stern taskmaster, he ordered his brother to only draw comics. Now, as a result of his obsession with comics, they had a little club centered on the creation of comics called Animal Town Comics Club. Charles was the self-appointed president of the business, while Robert was the vice president. Carol was the secretary, Sandra was the treasurer, and their youngest brother, Maxim, was the supply boy, a role he was never particularly fond of. 
In the immensely insightful documentary Crumb from 1994, Charles ponders that he might have been unconsciously imitating their overbearing tyrant of a father by forcing Robert to draw comic books when they were children. I was trying to compete with him, Crumb told a class of students in 1971, referring to his relationship with his older brother. He made me feel like shit if I couldn't draw as good as he. He'd criticize my cartoons, tell me how to draw better. I was always trying so hard to please him that finally I got so good, he gave it up. Chuck and Bob, Rumble the Panda, and Foo were among the titles they worked on. Now, being the young entrepreneurs they were, they would try to sell them door to door. Also, according to the documentary released in 1994, when Robert draws comics, he still thinks about whether Charles would approve of them. Now, on a totally different realm, Crom would say, My poor father, finally, he just gave up on us. We were hopeless. We kind of broke his heart, having his three useless sons. In this instance, Crom was referring to he and his brother's physical characteristics and the fact that they were all rejected by the army as inferior specimens for one reason or another. It is nearly impossible to talk about Robert Crumb's artistic roots without touching upon his sexual development, as it would play a defining role on the development of his personality. Now, his earliest sexual memories are from around four to five years of age, when his aunt would bounce him off her leg. He remembers then going to his mother's closet and humping a pair of cowboy boots that she wore when it rained. When he was six years old, he was sexually attracted to, believe it or not, Bugs Bunny. He would carry a picture of the cartoon character in his pocketbook and periodically look at it with excitement. Then by age 12, his sexual direction took more of a concrete hold as he became fixated on Sheena from the TV show Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, that was shown on television in 1955-56. He became totally obsessed with her and would fantasize about all the things he wanted to do with Sheena. Thus, his fascination and fetish with strong, large women got a foothold. The fantasies were one thing, while reality was a very different matter. Being an outsider his whole teenage life, by age 17, he began dreaming about going down in history as a great artist. That would be his revenge, a revenge he arguably achieved. And once he did reach that coveted, respected artist level, that female following he had long desired did indeed become a reality. Given that he didn't feel like he belonged in his own decade and time, he became an aficionado of music and pop culture of the 1920s and years prior. Now looking back on this, He viewed it as the U.S. getting more and more capitalistic and bankrupt, basically with little or nothing to show for itself. The past seemed so much more secure of itself and proud. In particular, his obsession revolved around collecting 78 RPM jazz and blues records, EC horror comics, and Walt Disney publications. As his obsessions escalated, Crom worked summer jobs to pay for his collecting habit. Eventually, after high school at age 19, he was invited by a pen pal to move to Cleveland. There, he found work at the American Greetings Corporation, where he was eventually promoted to the High Brow Department, which specialized in fanciful and joke-themed cards outside the mainstream of the usual style greeting cards. He worked in this department for four years, and according to him, he was still a lonely, maladjusted sex weirdo during this time. He'd create secret drawings of his sexual fantasies, only to later rip them up and flush them down the toilet once they were finished. It was during this time that he met Dana Morgan. Given his parents' constant fighting, Robert once told his father that he never wanted to get married. His father retaliated by telling him that he would marry the first girl who showed him any interest. Well, father knew best. Robert married Dana in June of 1964. According to his first wife, he was always drawing. If they were at a restaurant, 
he would draw on the placemat. On a bus, he'd draw on the ticket. Even their honeymoon trip through Europe was enhanced creatively by the sketchbooks given to him as a wedding gift by his colleagues at American Greetings. Drawing in sketchbooks became a lifelong habit. The marriage between Robert and Dana appears to have been a rocky one, with him frequently leaving and returning. He found himself slipping into the same routine as his father, a dressed-down corporate drone trapped in a dull cycle of work coupled with a strife-filled home. He knew that he needed an out. Well, a pathway to that out would come in June of 1965, when he would have a life-changing experience when he began taking LSD. He was miserable, trying to break free from the corporate America he felt he was sinking deeper and deeper into. Acid being legal at the time seemed like a good option to explore in hopes that it could perhaps alter his outlook on life. Taking acid changed my head around, he would later admit in an interview. It made me stop taking cartooning so seriously and showed me a whole other side of myself. His acid trips were, however, a mix of good and bad. For example, a hit of acid he dropped in New York circa October-November of 1965 caused a six-month state of mental fuzziness. It started out like any other LSD trip, he told the bibliographer Donald Finner, but then, somewhere in the middle of it, everything went fuzzy. It was in this state that he left his wife Dana for the first of numerous times. This fuzzy, weird electric fog would last for several months. To further quote Crum, things were never the same. The whole thing seemed like a shabby, cardboard, flat reality compared to the levels of meaning I saw under the influence of that drug. When people at work would ask him what was going on, he was out of words. He simply couldn't explain it. The whole world he was living in felt like a puppet show, a tragic farce. He couldn't imagine why anyone would want to live that way. Well, the acid trip would finally lose its hold and come to an end when he took yet another trip on a powerful acid dose with Dana in April of 1966. As confusing as the experience might have been, it was in this period that he invented most of the characters that were to populate his comics for years to come. All this crazy stuff came out of my brain. That's how I invented all those characters. Mr. Natural, Angel Fooled McSpade, Mr. Snoyd. In this brief but productive phase of major creativity, he resembles certain artists and even some scientists who accomplished most of their primary creative work by their early 20s. Now, unlike many other artists who succumbed to this cycle and never managed to get out of it, Crumb managed to stay remarkably prolific. Then, in January 1967, he ran into two friends during happy hour at Adele's bar in Cleveland. They told him that they were driving west, headed for San Francisco. San Francisco seemed like a different planet, a place that had progressed way beyond dreary old Cleveland. He asked if there was room for one more and joined them on the journey. And once settled, he felt guilty about abandoning his wife and soon summoned her. There were many hippie underground newspapers starting up in 66-67. Most towns would have more than one, and they would often be searching for art that related to the psychedelic experience or, one could say, the hippie ethics. Throwing himself in the midst of this wave, he began submitting LSD-inspired comics to some of these underground newspapers and found that most really liked his art. Soon thereafter, the head of Yarrowstalks told Crumb that he wanted him to do a whole issue for his paper. The issue was an instant success. He would continue with psychedelic comics, which in turn created more awareness of his art. His rise after having two issues of his comic Zap published happened very quickly. According to his wife, Linda, it happened in a matter of weeks. He was all of a sudden a name to be reckoned with. People began offering him big sums of money, but Crumb would turn them down immediately. He wasn't interested in success and fame. He just wanted to create good comic books. 
Now, after about a year of fame and recognition, he began writing about the dark sides of himself, which he had always kept hidden. That's when his true, hostile, pained self came out. Now, this shift solidified his presence in the underground comic circle. There was an important and obvious difference between the early underground comics and commercial comic books. The undergrounds were in black and white. This two-tone color scheme did two very important things. It created a sense of seriousness that colorful comics usually didn't exude. Furthermore, it linked underground comics to daily newspaper strips and Mad Magazine, which were the true inspiration for the style of comics that Crumb was trying to produce. By the end of the 1960s, Crumb had a son, Jesse, born in 1968. He would then buy some property in Potter Valley in Northern California. He came to be involved with several women around this time, though he also said that he didn't feel any more of a part of the hippie movement than he did of his high school. I never did become a hippie, he'd say. I used to live in the hate Ashbury and go to the love ends and all, but I never could get into the spirit of it somehow. He continued to explore the medium to its extremes, pushing sexual plots and violence to its limits while always staying true to himself and never, quote-unquote, selling out. With success came adoration and controversy, and on top of that, some more weirdness. But there was no denying that with the arrival of Robert Crumb, underground comics would never be the same again. As usual, let's end this episode with a quote from the original weirdo himself. I was always a contrarian. My wife says sometimes I'm too much so. Born weird. I always felt there's something odd and off about my nervous system. If everybody's walking forward, I want to walk backwards. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemour Hardin. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash houseofwords or paypal.me slash houseofwordspodcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Cristo M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason and Moorharden, and music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Cristo M. Sanchez and Jason and Moorharden.